Welcome in, everybody, to this episode of Discard for Magic, a Summoner Wars podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Aaron. And I'm the other host, James or Jexic. And today we're delighted to have on Dan Thoreau. Hello. Dan, for those who might not know who you are, why don't you just give what you do and how you've been a part of the board game community? Uh, Sure. So my name is Dan Thoreau. I write a website called Space Biff, where you can read about board games. And I have written about Summoner Wars many times. Yeah, I noticed a lot. Uh, You had a lot of battle reports and other things uh, from first edition, as well as an article where you said that you're glad you can't kill your own units and for magic and that that was a, a good change from first edition <laughs> yes how did you become a board game writer or viewer was this what you always did how did that happen so this isn't this isn't what i do for a living i teach college about 12 years ago something like that i i got into board games and i was loving board games i really fell in love And it seemed like nobody was writing the sort of board game reviews, the sort of criticism that I wanted to read. My personal motto is uh, that if something is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. So I started doing it badly. (laughs) And I've been doing it for a very long time now. So that's how I got started. And now it just sort of runs itself. I I write maybe two or three articles a week. It's not very time consuming. So it just keeps going. I don't think you're doing it badly. You're, in my opinion, one of the top written article reviewers for board games. I I love some of your articles, especially like the ones that you write about Summonors. When Summonors Second Edition was coming back out, and you wrote that long article about your love for the game, that was one of my favorite ones that you've done. Oh, thank you. And you said it was like coming home, and I kind of felt that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it really it really does feel that way, you know. I I wasn't sure when I talked to Colby. Uh, about the coming second edition, what it would look like or how it would change, because I think some things needed to change, right? Especially if if Plat Hat is going to ask people to buy it, because I I still have my, you know, Summoner Wars Alliance's mega box that weighs like a billion pounds. Um, I still have it. And so asking people to reinvest and, and go along on this ride again, especially the hobby scene having changed so much, some things needed to change. And then I played it and it really was like coming home. It just, it felt comfortable. It felt good. So it was, it was wonderful to be back. Like appreciate everything that they changed about it. Were there things that you felt like you missed from the first edition or things that you really enjoyed that they put into the second edition that you didn't see coming? I was surprised, uh, pleasantly so, by most of the changes. I think I think it's a better game. Even little things that are sort of mathematical changes, like commons feeling more worthwhile. You know, the meta game of the of the first edition sort of developed in a way I didn't like, and I I think that that eventually happens with every meta game <laughs> that people learn what works and then that prevails. You know, the original game had shifted so much toward champions that it kind of felt like common units mostly existed to fuel champions. And so that whole idea of killing your own units, you know, how how would you start a match if you were taking it really seriously? Well, you would murder your own units to get that magic boost so you could bring out champions. And so when the second, and, and you know, even the first game, there was more to the meta game. I don't want to re- be too reductive, you know. Eventually, uh, the team came up with all of these great ways where you had commons that were like anti-champions. But that still reflects that the, the meta game was largely built around champions. And so when the second edition came out and, and common units were a little beefier, that they had a little more to recommend them, I was really excited to see that. You asked the question, is there anything that, is, that has changed that I miss? And yes, there is. I, I do miss the tactility of taking magic cards and putting them in a magic pile. When you kill an opponent's unit and actually physically taking that unit and putting it in your magic pile, it makes more sense this way because, you know, you don't have to mix decks. But, you know, tracking magic with a chintzy little cardboard token just doesn't feel as good as having a magic pile. So I think that's a positive change, but I do miss it. Yeah, I still try to do that when I play in person now because I play most of my games online. 
I was playing with a friend yet a few weeks ago, and I kept trying to take his cards and put them in my in my discard right. pile. <laughs> I was like, wait a right, second, right. that doesn't work like that anymore. <laughs> you once described it as like an archaeological record of the game, which you don't have anymore. And that was that was fun, wasn't it? To be able to kind of look at the magic pile as you're going through it and see, well, here's the cards I sacrificed, and here's the cards I stole. And you were kind of digging through these layers of sediment that spoke to the things that had happened over the past couple of turns. And that, that was part of the game's charm, you know, and I don't want to sit here and talk only about like the things that the second edition doesn't do that the first edition did, but that I do miss that. I, I do think that was great. I think the one thing that changed for the better with that, with the way it works now is that it's a lot easier to make something like the fallen kingdom work or the fungal dwarves, because you just put your own stuff in your discard. You don't have to like kill them, get them back and then raise them from the dead. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, exactly. Or, or use a magic drain to steal your own units back with red so, You know, that was a thing you had to do too. Thank goodness the magic drain is gone. Drain was something that I don't miss from first edition. <laughs> you don't miss magic drain? <laughs> Wait, what about for the cloaks? Then it's the magic, right? <laughs> no, no. I don't I don't miss that. I do I love some of the like anti champions that they had in the first game. Like Filth was one of my favorite factions to play and like the claw mutant coming out and rolling dice equal to like the health up to like I think it was max at five or something. But stuff like that I thought was really fun in first edition. And there's some stuff like that in the second edition too. But you're rolling more, you got more health. It feels like a bigger outcome, even though it's probably proportionally about the same. The other thing I, I miss, and I'm glad you kind of alluded to it, was like the first game, because it was a little bit more of like a hobbyist product, you know, it was a little more amateurish. It was allowed to run a little more wild. It didn't have to think about like as many long-term concerns of balance. And eventually those became problems. But in the moment, things like the Swamp Orcs like actually filling up the board with swamps or the filth having all their mutations and just running wild. You know, there was a certain wooliness to the first edition that even though it wasn't as playable as the second edition, and I really do think the second edition is the better game. You know, I'm not, I'm not actually interested in going back to the first edition, but that first edition really was allowed to kind of run with its imagination and express its creativity in a way that I don't think the second edition at least so far, has been able to. Yeah, Colby's definitely said he doesn't want to bring back extra decks like the Conjurations or the Swamp Orc Vine Walls, but I am curious to see what happens with the Filth, because they're they're slated for the next wave, and it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Are you a playtester? Do you guys have, like, ins? Do you secretly know? Or are you just saying, like, (laughs) I'm curious, but you actually know? Okay, we are playtesters, but we are also still curious. We don't know that very far in advance. So, like, I am actually curious what they do with the filth, because I don't know how much I can say, but basically we don't have the filth yet. (laughs) That's that's what I can say. Okay, okay. (laughs) And I think we can say stuff that's already been put out into the world by Colby and like Joe and Nick. So for example, we're currently playtesting the Storm Goblins, but we don't know like what's after that. We just know like what we're testing right now. And then after that, they don't, they don't give us a lot of heads up. Sometimes they'll be like, oh, this one's probably next. Have you been following along with the previews and everything about what's coming out? I haven't. I do receive, I don't actually know if I'm subscribed or if Colby just sends them to me. I should maybe <laughs> look that up. I have received up through, I was playing pretty regularly last year but haven't been keeping up in the last part of the year because of convention season um but oh who are the two factions that i have on my table over there i can't quite see them but it's like scarlet something i don't know oh oh, maybe the crimson order and the mountain varga yeah i think so something like that so i've been keeping up on the releases in terms of them getting sent to me but i haven't played everything i guess that leads into a bit another question we were having so like at at one point in time someone wars first edition was probably your favorite game just based on the sheer volume of what you were writing and you were playing it with your your wife a lot before the app came out or even probably after the app came out what do you think has changed has the industry changed around you or have you changed away from summoner wars do you think That's a good question. I think it's probably a combination. When Summoner Wars First Edition came out, it was one of the only good board games I own. (laughs) (laughs) I, you know, I think 10 years ago, it was, it was a golden age, right? There were a lot of great board games and crowdfunding was new. And we were seeing a lot of like small companies like Plaid Hat that previously probably would have been priced out of the industry that were able to come in and do exciting stuff. That meant at the same time, and this, I mean, the same is true to an extent now, but there was a lot of garbage and Summoner Wars just, it, it arrived at like the exact right time in my life. 
I didn't have kids. I was married, so I wasn't even like spending time dating. I just had an enormous, I was in grad school. So I just had like this enormous amount of time to pursue one game. And I, I, I tend to be really wary of lifestyle games. Like, like I never really got into Netrunner, for instance, just because I didn't like having to like build my decks over and over, like every couple of months. But Summoner War afforded me a lot of a lot of flexibility because building its decks were pretty easy. Like you could do it like in ten minutes before you played. Like it could even just be part of like a, an informal sit down tournament that everyone kind of grabbed their reinforcements and built a deck. It was the right heft and complexity. It was the right time in my life. I think it arrived at the right time in the in the industry uh, in the industry's lifespan. And the second edition, a lot has changed. I've changed in that now I have two kids, so my gaming time is a little... It's not more limited. I still play a lot of games. I shouldn't misrepresent myself. But I spend a lot of time with different games. I do write about games semi-professionally. I don't know how I would phrase it. And so I play a lot of new games. I have less time to devote to one game. So a lot has changed. So you think that uh, because of your writing about games, you kind of pulls you in directions to, to, to play just more new things and, and have more interesting new things to talk about then? Yeah, it could be that. I think that has a, a big part to play. And I, you know, I know that there's, there's a lot of burnout in terms of people who write about board games or create videos about board games. Like it, on the outside, it seems very easy and carefree. And so every year we'll see dozens of people who are like, oh, I can, I can be a reviewer. And they, they start trying to do it. And then, you know, within three months to a year, they burn out and they're done. And I think some of that is that you get away from the hobby that you liked, the hobby of playing and enjoying and mastering board games. And so for me, I don't feel that burnout. And a big reason is because for me, the hobby is not actually board games. It's writing about board games. And so sometimes I will miss like, it would be fun to just play one game like Summoner Wars and do nothing else and have every weekend do little pickup tournaments the way we did, you know, 12 years ago. But I don't actually want to do that. That's not my goal. That's not what my hobby is. I like to write about this stuff. And I don't know if there's enough material there to write about, to write 130 articles a year about Summoner Wars. I think even I'd have trouble doing that. <laughs> I don't know if you follow, how, maybe not, but I used to write a ton about HeroScape. And now I look back and I'm like, wow, how did I find that much to write about? Like your earlier Summoner Wars stuff reminds me of the time I spent with HeroScape, where it's just like you take this relatively simple game and just run with it, you know? And I think, so you think you're basically just kind of replace the, the writing you did with some of that with, with just more writing about different games and, and, and experience different things you review a ton of games dan does it ever feel a bit like a, a chore having to like review a game I really would rather be playing this game night at like our born game night but instead i really got to try out this game because somebody like sent it to me and i want to review it but it's just i'm just not in the mood i mean yeah that absolutely happens so like i mentioned last year i was playing a lot more summoner wars uh second edition actually the hardest type of game for me to play is two player games. My wife went back to school. She went to optometry school last year. And so she's just she's too busy to play a lot of board games. And so and two player games like everyone has their cool two player dueling game idea and most of them aren't that good anyway. And a lot of war games that I do try to cover are also two player. So it's just like this really crammed field. Getting three, four, five player games done are that's easy because I have regular, you know, game nights with three, four, and five people. But two player games are super hard. But I have a friend who lives really quite near to me, and he is my two player game buddy. So Last year, we started meeting every week to play two-player games, and we do go through a lot of games that, like, I have to go through, you know, quote-unquote. Like, I feel like I don't necessarily have to do much. I can quit anytime I want, right? Just like tobacco. <laughs> so he and I were doing, like, we would play two or three games in a night that I had on my slate for review, and then we would play Summoner Wars. And it was just so refreshing and fun to dive into this game that I have a relatively high degree of mastery for that I, I know the mechanics, I know the strategies, I have a pretty good familiarity with the decks, and just diving in and having a good time as opposed to like learning something. You know, with the holiday season, we've kind of tapered off, so we need to get back into it. But 
part of what I'm looking forward to is let's play more Summoner Wars. It's so good. Have you played online at all with Summoner Wars? Yeah, I had I had a you know when uh, when Colby first launched the second edition, he was kind enough to gift me a digital subscription. <laughs> I played it a ton, and then I logged in and it said my subscription had lapsed. <laughs> I guess I used up my reviewer, so I I haven't figured out how to renew it. It was just one of those things that when I had it and when it was there on in a browser window on my on my desktop and on my phone, I was going to play it, but. Once it lapsed, I moved on to other things, I guess. They're working on a iOS and Android versions soon, soon too, so there should be like a, a dedicated app within some amount of time. We're not exactly sure, but hopefully like a month or so. That's great. I mean, everything, I, you know, I'm curious to talk to them, and maybe, maybe the two of you know, that it feels like the industry being in such a different place from when the first edition launched that... Now they have to do the subscription model and, and I hope it's being successful for them because, you know, I, I could see how it might not be. So I hope it's working out and yeah, an app would be great. Yeah. Aaron and I aren't privy to the numbers and I was wondering about that recently too, because I was talking to a friend and he was saying, well, maybe they have all the people that want to play Summoner Wars. And I said, I don't know about that. And also, but his big thing is, are, is it doing better or worse than first edition? And I don't even know the answer to that question. So I'd be curious also, I know that they're doing pretty good with the subscriptions. There's been some recent like push in the community for like better ways to like share the subscriptions with friends because it's hard when you're playing online, when you're playing with somebody who you don't like, you're not close to like geographic, do like share a deck with them and they give you one free deck on the app, but if the person doesn't like that free deck or just has like a bad time with that free deck and they want to try something new, they have to pull subscription. And so there's been people pushing in the community to like share decks that they've already bought. One feature we're trying to push for is like, if I want to play a game with Dan, I can be like, okay, here's a private link for a game. And then he can play any of the decks that I've got kind of thing. Well, and so much of community building is about that sort of thing, right? Like, I remember back in the day when Plat Hat Games had their forum that I I made friends on the Plat Hat Games forum that I'm still friends with, you know, that come over to my house and play games with me when they're in town because we met through Summoner Wars and through the Plat Hat Games forum. I don't think they have that forum anymore, do they? They don't have the forum. We've been using Discord, which is not exactly the, the best like, fix for it, but that seems to be the way a lot of things are going these days. It's Discord using and then... Also, Massimo uh, is running the league and people. So like between the discord and the league, you kind of get some of that going because like with, he also has the, the like profiles on the league website called SWZone.com. And over there, I was able to uh, find out that there was a guy who lived like an hour away from me who played and was one of the better players, too. And so uh, we we linked up and played a few times as well. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, and they're working on like a dedicated Summoner Wars website too, but all stuff in the works. The absence of that stuff does make it hard to gauge, right? Like back in the day, it felt like the community was decently big and always growing. And now I, you know, maybe it's because I don't join too many discords. Get into a bunch of them and then it's hard to follow what's going on. That's my main issue with discord is that it's harder to follow. Like if you leave a discussion for a few days, you have no idea what's going on. It seems like compared to a forum, you can kind of like search and look around and things are more subdivided a little bit, but our, our discord has a lot of different sections. So if you just want to know about a certain faction or a rules question, it's pretty easy to find that most of the time where people are pretty responsive to rules questions we don't mind answering the same rules question over and over again <laughs> you're a saint i do i hate answering the same rules question over and over again my only pet peeve with rules questions is when like you give somebody the answer and it's right you know it's the way the way app works you know it's the way the game works and they're like yeah but it shouldn't be like that <laughs> you know like, <laughs> like they just don't take your answer <laughs> it's like i don't think that's what the card says it's like well i don't know i, I don't want to get into card game semantics or or, or, or syntax <laughs> with you right now but that's how it works <laughs> <laughs> that's my own personal thing but i don't know i still like answering the questions or get or help trying to be helpful so then uh you were saying in first edition you you found deck construction very easy because you just kind of like grab the reinforcement packs and swap in a few commons have you experimented with deck construction at all in second edition or do you find it more daunting I just haven't had the time, you know, so, so with my friend that I was playing with for the first half of last year, a bunch of Summoner Wars, we were basically just, so he hasn't played nearly as, as much Summoner Wars as I have. Most people haven't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> 
And he, he's a very good, talented game player. And so he kind of came in at the tail end of Summoner Wars, like Alliances was already out. So it was kind of daunting, but he was, he was picking up the old packs. I gave him a few duplicates that I had. And so he's, he, he's interested and he's subscribed and he gets all of the packs and stuff. And so we were kind of planning that once we have internalized all of the new factions, then we'll try some deck building, but we just hadn't reached that point because there's such a, there's such a wealth of material to explore without the deck building that we are, we were a little intimidated. I am invested enough that I want to buy those magnetic boxes. <laughs> They're gorgeous. Are they going, are they going to make them for the later factions? Or if I buy them, do I just have like the 12 original factions that will look cool and everyone else is in a baggie? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a question for Colby. I don't know the answer to that. I think they plan to make more, but I haven't heard yet about it because they're coming close on needing another 12 by around May or so. We'll probably have the next decks out. That's my guess. Yeah, they haven't even been announced. I guess that has ruined something. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. The cycle seems to be every three months they release two new decks, and these are coming out in January. So my guess was, you know, April or May. What we should have the rest of Wave Four. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to those Toads. So we'll see. By the time people hear this, they will have those. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Toads are. They're, they're, they're a fun one. I think you'll enjoy them. I guess that's another question. I know you. we were looking and we saw that you like the Jungle Elves the best or one of your favorite factions. Who have you kind of gravitated to in second edition? So yeah, I loved the Jungle Elves. I, I tend to love to play assassination decks. I'm very much the enemy summoner is down as a kind of player. Board position, let's, let's take hits as long as we're trading hits on the enemy summoner. So I loved the jungle elves and I'm still really liking the Savannah elves. They're, they're kind of, they're reimagining. I played with my buddy who I've been playing with and he got a little fired up because of some of their new movement tricks. Is it their deck that lets you move like diagonally? That's the wayfarers. Okay. So yeah, so we were, we played a few games. And I think he was having a rough week because I beat him with the Savannah Elves and then I was trying the Wayfarers. And it was just like teleporting straight to his summoner every time. Which of course wouldn't happen if he, you know, once we've played a few times and he knows how to grid properly. He was getting a little fired up about that. It's just so perfect. I love it. I love making people mad. <laughs> <laughs> Who else can make people mad in that way? Yeah, Wayfarers are probably one of the better ones. Well, cloaks are good at that too. I mean, like obsidian dwarves are definitely like they don't have movement tricks, but they definitely have like we can just do so much damage kind of tricks. Because the answer to like is my summoner safe against the obsidian dwarves is almost always no. <laughs> like you don't want to take the risk of, <laughs> of putting him out there. Yeah, are you within four spaces of Balzar? Then no. It feels like they've really done a great job of putting in just very exciting abilities that every time I play a deck, I just cannot wait to see all of the wacky things that they're going to do sometimes that i just i wouldn't have conceptualized so because let me let me share a secret with you that i've never told anybody are you ready exclusive yeah this is this is a scoop i back in the day you might remember uh especially because i know i know at least at least you james you were around since like the first days right i designed a summoner wars deck yeah i was a nerd <laughs> oh just like on your own you like had a custom one what was the premise it was based on like Eastern European uh, werewolf stories. And so the, the deck was split between kind of these crappy peasant crossbow people who they would hide behind little palisades. It was like walls you could shoot over. Your summoner himself, he could turn into like werewolf forms. And so it was a very summoner forward, supplemented by crappy peasant infantry and archers behind palisades. And I was so into I designed the cards. I printed them off. I played with them. I was a big nerd. I'm sure they weren't any good, but that was kind of back in the wild days when everyone was making Summoner Wars decks, right? Not to knock what you did, but I feel like it's e like the, it's a rich environment to come up with something cool. But the development and the balance is a lot harder than it looks, I think, you know? It is. <laughs> it's like to make it like, okay, the numbers are about right, but is this fun? Is this compelling? Like it takes a while it can, or it can. I definitely like the idea of a vampire theme or a, not a vampire, like a werewolf theme. I was thinking of something similar in second edition of like, what if there is a, a faction where they get boosts, you know? And then once they get a certain number of boosts, they transform into werewolves. Yeah, I think a werewolf faction in second edition would be really cool. We could uh, use it to counteract the vampires we just got not too long ago. Crimson Order versus the werewolves. I, I, I think that'd be a, a cool showdown, especially if it was like summoner centric, like you said. 
and you just got a giant werewolf running around and then a bunch of peasants with him. So the Crimson Order, those are vampires, because I so I haven't played them yet. If you recall Mad Syrian's ability where if he damages something, he gets healed. That summoner mm-hmm. has that ability again called Blood Drain, but his name is different. Oh, cool. But he's kind of got a similar thing to what you're talking about with the peasants being weak. He's got all these little cultists that when they die, something good happens. He can heal whenever he does damage to something. And they have a long lasting thing. They have lots of weak units and a few very powerful units. Yeah, they're they're a menace right now. People are still trying to figure out how to win with certain factions against them. The interesting thing is they, because they have so many zero cost units, they tend to flood the board with magic. So your opponents are able to sub- summon more champions too. So it kind of changes the way the economy works in the game as well. And you can't kill him for magic. That's a real bummer. Worst change ever. <laughs> <laughs> he does attack his own guy. He's one of the few summoners who will attack his own units just because he can heal off of them too. He just won't get magic. Oh, that's cool. So you can feed on his cultists if he wants. Well, that's very vampiric. It's good thematically and has some some great art, I think, but it's definitely, it's been one of the more polarizing decks in terms of people's opinions. I'll, I'll pick them next time I play against my friend I'll, and I'll pick like an under un, underpowered faction for him. Except I, I was always a fan of the underdogs. I, I loved picking the original Vanguard and trying to win with them in a tournament and not getting very far. <laughs> I mean, it's always fun when you when you win with the people they don't expect you to win with. Did you ever play the uh, second summoner for the Jungle Elves in the first edition? I did, but you'll have to remind me. I, I always knew Abuav pretty well. What was the second summoner? He had some events that allowed him to move really far or like heal or and he had the poison markers. I think he's one of the only decks with poison markers. Oh, that's right. His name was Nakuya Na, I think, and he had like a lot of animals too, because he had a he had a guy that could copy the animals. I think. Yeah, he had a guy who could copy the animals. He was like the that was his spirit form or something. Yeah, I I did play as him. He he's kind of looks like Agent Forty Seven, right? Yeah, yeah, he does. Like Agent Forty Seven transported into Summoner Wars. I did play as him. You know, just as the years went on, I I just played less and less. First, the second summoners. And then Alliances. Alliances was kind of where I started breaking up with the game a little more. Not because it was bad. I, I appreciated a lot of the options. It was so much. And I, I wonder if every game just reaches that point where the metagame has sprawled out and, you know, the the designers are kind of fighting against the metagame. I don't know. Or maybe I just changed. Yeah, it's hard to say. I eventually didn't play as much uh, in first edition as well, but around the same time or kind of by by the, the last few second summoners. I ironically didn't play the Jexic deck very much, even though he was named after me. <laughs> like, I, I played against him in a tournament and lost. I was like, oh, this is embarrassing. I don't know what this guy does. Ah. Lost to yourself. I did. I don't even remember who I was playing. I just remember playing against Jexic and being like, ah, this is imbalanced and broken. No, I didn't actually think it was balanced, but it was one of those. It's always the thing. It's like if someone thinks the deck is broken, just let them try it and then see what happens the second time. So does Jexic, the, does the summoner have your face? In, the, in first edition, he did. He has my face from 10 years ago. So now it, now you're even more handsome. I jokingly say I probably look more like the machinist now from the cloaks, if, you, if you're familiar with their deck. But basically, he's he's heftier. He's heftier than Vlox is. <laughs> Oh, there I see it. Yeah. Oh, this is this guy. There's a lot to love about this guy. I'd say between him and the rogue, the the wayward rogue from the uh, the Wayfarers. Very cool. Yeah, the rogue was my avatar for a little while when I was playing a lot of Wayfarers on the the app, and then now I'm I switched to the Smasher just because I think he's a nice guy that uh, is a little under uh, misunderstood. You know, that's why I named him the Smasher because he's a nice guy. He's just misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> he just looks like he's just there because he's a yeah. You know, like he just can't help it. He's just so big. He's got to be able. He's got to smash. You know. I mean, it's tough when you're just the big guy and you've been asked to smash things your entire life and not even something that you want to do it's just it's just your life now but also they don't have a brub avatar i'll probably switch to that that's available brub is the the mercenary who i play in the tundra orcs who i probably try to bring up every podcast i think that that it's relevant you like the savannah elves and you like factions that get at the summoner a lot what like what other factions that you played have really stood out to you that you've liked are there any that you really have not liked like i struggle with trash mobs so like cave goblins where i have to like figure out how to like screw with the phases okay i'm going to attack during movement or i'm going to move during attack or i'm going to try to generate extra attacks beyond the three i struggle with those just because i feel like face to face 
you can kind of get away with cheating a little bit, not like real cheating, but like, you know, where you're like, oh, I was going to move this guy. Can I take that back? People being bros will be like, yeah, that's fine. You know, it's hard to keep track sometimes of those cascading effects. But then when I was playing um, on the app, it was too hard. <laughs> I, I was making too many mistakes. If I'm going to play an attrition game, I love the polar dwarves. Just the the creeping, crushing glacier walls and using them to, like, the board is just very gradually pushing back the opponent. It, it feels so thematic, and it is such a jerky way to play. Out of the core set people, I think they were one of my favorite. Yeah, they were one of mine, too, I think. That, but I also really like the cave goblins. <laughs> I think you are contractually obligated to like them, so. I don't know if I could describe any that I just outright dislike. Are there any that you two particularly dislike? You know, I won't tell Colby. <laughs> I dislike the ones Aaron likes for the most part. Yeah, that's pretty much true. <laughs> like the ones that are my favorites, uh, James hates. Aaron just likes them all, though. We share a couple like cave goblins, but like Fallen Kingdom and Fungal Dwarves that I really like, he hates because he doesn't like the infects. I generally don't like attacking my own units. The only exception I will make is when you can use brutal force with like the tundra orcs or other decks that can use that and you hit your own guys forward to hit their summoner or something then it's cool for the most part and this speaks to like how good second edition is i really enjoy basically every deck there's a couple decks that i i don't like as much like my favorites are probably shadow elves and breakers just because i'm not very good with them and i don't understand them people do super well with them and like push the units around or pull the units back to shadow and just keep attacking me with the same unit for seven turns and i just i don't get it like i when i play them they just don't work that well that's how i'm with the fallen kingdom it's like oh i know these combos exist but they also their champions are a little weaker, and I tend to like to play champions. So Fallen Kingdom are definitely not a champion centric deck anymore. So, although they kind of were in first edition because you could play Force Summon to get a loot ball out on like turn two, and then just like smash people with with the loot ball. But that's not a thing anymore. Yeah, breakers I think are tough. I I still just call them benders on accident. Um, the benders thing makes me think of. Uh, like Avatar The Last Airbender and all that. I always think about the uh, Shut Up and Sit Down reveal, you know, where they, they loved the game. And when they did their little reveal of the master set and were just making fun of everybody, and then their, their little article just had this brief interruption where they're going, why did they name them the Benders? Isn't that like a UK slang for a gay man or something? That's why that's been changed, and I believe is why it was changed. Yeah, I imagine it is. And I remember at the time being like, I feel like you can't say anything without it being something bad in UK slang. So, <laughs> yeah, I forgot they said that in that review. Have you tried, Dan, any of the... I know you go to conventions sometimes. Did you play in any of the convention tournaments or any of the online tournaments? Not since the second edition. In the first edition, I did some of the uh, app tournaments. I wrote an article about an unexpected win that I had in one of the app tournaments where I, where I actually won with an angel somehow. And that was probably the high water mark of me playing uh, Summoner Wars, was winning with an angel. Like you thought you were safe. But I jumped over your wall. Yeah, exactly. That's what happened. My opponent was very upset. I wasn't playing against one of you, was I? Uh, no, I don't think so. Could have been. Who knows? Yeah, if, if so, I apologize. It was someone... Okay, I found the article. It was someone named Glenn3E. Oh, Glenn still plays. Oh, he's really good. He mostly tests these days. I haven't seen him. But yeah, he's very yeah, good. Yeah, Glenn's, Glenn's a very good player. Yeah, so I beat him. And uh, my apologize to Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> i i was on the ropes i had like one hit point left i was i was not doing great totally outnumbered everyone was dead except for my summoner and then i flew an angel over a, summoned and flew an angel over an enemy to kill his summoner and that was it i wrote that review in november of 2012 which really is making me feel gray haired oh i was gonna say it's just 11 years ago but it's a little more than 11 yeah. years ago <laughs> We're in the new year now. I'm glad it's back. I'm glad Sun Wars is back in the world. Is there a thriving like uh, convention tournament scene in person as well? There's usually been one at Gen Con. Okay. And I think they had a couple others, but there's not much. I mean, I like I said, I, I met a guy who lives like an hour away. We might try to get a, a, a scene going in Illinois, but it's still kind of very much 
in the pre-planning stage there, you know. We just kind of have to get more folks playing first, I think, or at least in this area, or find more. Like, I'm, I've am i been recruiting my nephews, you know. They've been playing a little bit, but <laughs> one of them's actually in his 20s now. I'm talking about the gray-haired stuff. I got him to join the league, and he's, like, 21, so we'll see how he does, but we've been playing on and off, he and I. I remember in the first, for the first edition, very briefly at my local game store, I was chatting with the owner and for a few, for a few months, I would come in once a month with Summoner Wars and there were a few people who would come in and we would play. It was kind of back in the day when we all felt it was our job to be like game evangelists. And I was teaching it and playing it re fairly regularly. And then it just fell apart because it wasn't magic. And there's there's only a handful of games that really have that staying power in local game stores. And also like sort of like the built-in prize structure is a thing too, I think. Because you can't just like give someone a pack and summon awards because they've already got it, you know? Like... <laughs> To some extent. Yeah, and it was it's just different now. Like I ha I don't even think I've been to a game store in like three years. Some of that I think is just COVID. <laughs> but but there's also just an element I can't imagine like making the time commitment to go to a game store and try to establish some grassroots league anymore. I apologize that the 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 takeaway from this podcast is that the average summoner wars player is now old. A, a number of we got a number of new players who are who who are new to second edition, you know, who found it either through your articles or shut up and sit down or other ones that didn't play first edition so some of them are younger some of them are older but yeah maybe you're right about the average one yeah it's the shut up and sit down uh review for second edition and your article brought a lot of new players to to the second edition when it came out so that was that was super cool this is making me i i feel like i need to play summoner wars like tonight i agree <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm going to learn my Crimson Order tonight. <laughs> At the very least, I should open it up out of that little pack and, and take a look. Because now I'm excited about the idea of killing some of my own people. <laughs> you can be a vampire. I'm looking at some of the cards now from uh, the Plat Hat game site, and Baron Damar sure looks like a grump, doesn't he? So <laughs> I'm excited to try that. Yeah, they have some fun like thematic cards, too. You can like convert... Um other opponents units into like your own cultists by and like uh transfuse like your hurt units and the the thematic aspect of the vampire deck is is really good do they still write like i i remember at the time that not only would there be like the preview pieces but they would also write like little short stories and at the time those are coming are they coming? Okay, I didn't know if they were still emphasizing that or what. There's not any out, but but we've been told that when the new website launches, there should be bios for the first like probably dozen decks or so. So we're excited for that too. Yeah, that's kind of fun. It, it's interesting how like that kind of stuff has never really worked for me, but it is interesting, you know, that people will write like background and fanfic about like their Overwatch characters, you know, and and so getting people excited that way because I know that when I was playing a lot of the first edition. We, some of our players would be like, oh, did you read the latest story about uh, so-and-so? And as someone who, to whom that did not appeal, I was going like, oh, <laughs> no, but that's awesome. You know, I'm glad that's something that you like. My last question that is kind of silly. I saw you had a Root article that compared him to Foucault or compared the Cole Whirl and his work to Foucault. Is there is there any deeper philosophical underpinnings in Summoner Wars, or is it just fun? You know, I, I think there are some deeper philosophical underpinnings. I always worry because... So when I wrote my series, Foucault in the Woodland, talking about, like, Root and the philosophical class-based stuff that's going on in that game, which I should... Which I need to say is deliberate. Oh, yeah. I do agree. Cole, yeah, he bases it on real world stuff and then makes it into animals. So some people were like, what is this wanky, you know, crap? No, it, it, he did do that on purpose. Um, I do think there are some really interesting little tidbits in Summoner Wars. I don't think they're deliberate. And I'm always wary of bringing that stuff up because every time I do, people are like, you just like to make up crap about board games. But I do think there are some interesting things to be said about the way that this world sort of inadvertently creates like a value structure, sort of a class structure based on proximity to these summoning stones. Like in playing these games, I do sort of wonder like, I, I don't know if I think Sarah Eldwin is really all that much better than like, you know, and I don't know. I don't know the fluff. Maybe she's a saint compared to Baron Dimar, you know, she's not killing her commons for magic anymore. But like even that terminology, common unit, there's sort of an essential like classism to it. 
which I think is really interesting. But that's just me kind of navel gazing whenever I play the game and looking at that. It's super intentional in something like the High Elves. I don't know if you've played m- much with them or looked at them, but the High Elves have this. Definitely, there's some class stuff going on there. Which deck is that? The High Elves. Oh, the High Elves. I have played them. Let me look them up. Their whole thing is that the commons are subject to the laws and the champions and the summoner are not. Are they the ones who add like the weird, like they kind of have double edged abilities? Yeah. The auras. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they have some laws that are auras based on their commons. Then they also have some like blanket events that are laws that affect both sides commons as well, but never really the, the champions. And, um, the summoner's abilities like dictate and oblige her epic, both works exclusively on, on commons. So she kind of like orders the commons around and they all have their faces covered or their eyes covered, but it's not the same for the champions and stuff. And her name is Valeria the Just. A lot of the people on, on the Discord are saying that, that she probably like called herself that and then hope it stuck. <laughs> she totally did. She totally did. She's the kind of person who her idea of justice is like in grade school when one of her friends had to skip class to get something to eat because they were starving at home she like ratted them out to the teacher yeah so i do think about that sometimes if it has anything deeper to say i mean the absence of any like you know i haven't read any fiction or anything about the world but i think there are glimmers of that and yeah that's a great example the high elves i should i should play them more i did i've only played as them once though and their auras were really interesting just the way that they kind of bind your own units um what jerks <laughs> yeah some people say they're one of the most complicated decks i find them a little less complicated because they remind me a lot of playing hero scape which was one of my big game about over a decade ago because that had a lot of like the positional stuff and the aura based benefits and malices and stuff but they're a fun one they're one of my favorites even though i'm not the best with them yet dan have you had any games you've reviewed recently that you think our listeners would really enjoy or games you've been enjoying recently there are always games that I am playing that I enjoy. Just yesterday, I, re- I reviewed a game that you might not have heard of called Freelancers. <laughs> <laughs> so have you two played Freelancers? Are you obligated to play everything? No, I, I've not played it yet. I, um, I've heard people playing it, and they seem to be having a good time. We played Freelancers for, I think, the third time just this last weekend, and everyone was laughing themselves silly. It's really well written. It's really funny. We had a great time with it. I don't think it's a an amazing game if what you're looking for is like a tight resource conversion game. It's not that. Pretty much an excuse to sit down and read some or listen to some narrated funny dialogue. And it, it does a great job of that. So I really enjoyed that. If your listeners are Plaid Hat fans, maybe they should look at some of Plaid Hat's other properties like uh, Freelancers. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to try it myself yet, but I, I really want to. I think it's got a lot to offer probably i played forgotten waters a couple times and i thought that was really good and one of my big issues with forgotten waters was just the time commitment yes it was like a often like a, yeah like a four hour time commitment freelancers i've heard is a, a it's an easier time commitment like an hour to two versus the four hours of forgotten waters yeah every session has been about two hours for us which is totally reasonable. You know, that's, that's like going to a movie. That's like sitting down to watch a couple episodes of a show. That, that's a pretty normal like slice of time to digest something, I think, in our society. So I've been playing another game that I'm going to review soon that maybe your audience would be a little divided on. And I know I am. It's called Pagan Fate of Rono. Have you heard of Pagan? I have not. Uh. So it kind of comes out of some people wanting to capitalize on like the demise of Netrunner. And what it is, is uh, it's two people. So it's set kind of in this early pilgrim time period. And there's always two players. It's a little asymmetrical. One person is a witch who is trying to cast a spell on a village of early settlers. And the other person though is a witch hunter who is interrogating the villagers to find the witch. So it's a it is a deck construction two player dueling card game and i am really mixed on it it generated some nice early buzz the first of its decks are finally coming out so that there's some deck construction and it requires deck construction more than like summoner wars does the starting decks have some big holes in them and so i've been playing that a lot and 
it does some really smart stuff. There's a lot of deduction, kind of like, have you played Netrunner? Yeah, a few times, yeah. You know, Netrunner kind of plays with deduction and having to figure things out. So does this game. And in some ways, I would even say it does a few things better than Netrunner. But on the whole, I think it might be a little broken. So that's maybe a game that uh, fans of two-player dueling games might have strong opinions on. Yeah, definitely something that I'm interested to check out after you described it. It seems like a fun back and forth between uh, two players. It's also an interesting thematic aspect. I don't know if I've played another game where there's like a witch hunter and a witch and it's a two player. Because there's like hidden role games that give similar feels to that, but and hidden movement games that also do a similar thing. But a two player with deck construction I feel like that's got a lot to offer, maybe. Yeah, and it's pretty cool because it put so the the way that the board is arranged is you you put this little long skinny board between the players that have nine villagers on it, and those villagers can change in between games, and it's kind of neat in that if you're playing like in a tournament setting or something like that, that the witch will choose three of the villagers, the witch hunter will choose three of the villagers, and then the scenario that you play chooses the other three villagers. So in like a tournament scenario, even, you know, your roles will be set, but the way that you arrange that shared board between you is going to be negotiated between the players. And then at the start of the game, you randomly shuffle nine villager cards representing the nine villagers in between you. And the one that you draw in secret as the witch is the witch's identity. And so it's, it's very tactile and tangible that you have this thing that you're both looking at these nine villagers and the witch is trying to empower one of them without tipping her hand to the witch hunter who he should execute. <laughs> it's, it has some really great tension. I'm just not sure. Like, it's the kind of game that I hope gets a second edition in 10 years, like Summoner Wars, to kind of like make it perfect. But it's very interesting. Yeah, that's super cool. Dan, with a lot of your reviews, I especially on like your podcast... I found that you do a lot of games that have a lot to bring not only to the, like the board game world, but also to like world in general with like different like social justice aspects of like, I listened to your episode on the podcast where you, you talk to the designer of like votes for women and you do a lot of those aspects. Are those games that you seek out because of those like social justice aspects or do they just come to you? That's a great question. I spend a lot of time looking for board games that might otherwise go unnoticed. I just don't think that I add anything to the world if I if I review the latest Euro that has sold a million copies. So I, li I like to try to highlight things that maybe have flown under the radar or that say something that I think is valuable. And also, I do tend to take the stance that if we, you know, you rewind a hundred years from right now, and there were a lot of people voicing their suspicion that film could not be had no artistic merits, right? That film was pretty much for newsreels and pornography. And it was not seen as something that was that was there for legitimate artistic expression. And we've seen that that has happened with basically every medium. Roger Ebert kind of infamously thought that video games couldn't be art. Now, I don't actually think that debate is settled. I, I don't even know if board games or video games are art. I don't think, I think that's sort of secondary. I don't think it really matters. I think that they become art the instant you just stop having that conversation and start using them as art. But I think board games are doing some really exciting things. I have seen people play certain board games that did change their mind about certain issues. And more than that, I think that most people have learned something from a board game, even if they didn't realize it. Even if the thing they learned was as simple as like geography. You know, there are a lot of people who know where Manchuria is because they played Risk. And I think that's valuable. And I think there are a handful of game designers right now who are really leaning into and leveraging the unique strengths of board games to, to make a point. And so when I'm out and I'm looking for board games uh, to play and to write about, the people that I am more inclined to reach out to are those who are treating board games seriously. And I think it's, I think it's just a natural side effect of treating board games seriously that they will then use board games to try to make a serious point. I don't know if that's a, a good enough answer to your question, but that's probably as straightforward as it gets. So if people want to find you and hear more from things that you've written, where would they do that? 
Um, the easiest is just to go to my site, which is spacebiff.com. You can also find me on places like Twitter and Blue Sky, uh, where I just go by my name, Dan Thoreau, Dan Thorot, and that's <laughs> that's pretty much it. That's that's me. I'm pretty simple. Well, we appreciate you coming on the podcast, Dan, and maybe we'll have you back at some point for some further summoner wars discussion but we hope people will go check out your reviews and your writings they're always very insightful and they they cover a wide variety of different games which i think is uh, it's fun to experience well thank you so much for having me it was lovely and i'm i'm gonna go and play some summoner wars tonight thanks again for coming on we appreciate everybody listening this has been discard for magic and we'll see you guys in a couple weeks 